What's the easiest choice you can make? Window instead of middle seat? Picking a vendor who sends a great gift basket? Outsourcing business tasks you hate? What about selling with Shopify? Whether you're selling a little or a lot, Shopify helps you do your thing, however you cha-ching. Shopify is the global commerce platform that helps you sell at every stage of your business. From the launch your online shop stage to the first real-life store stage, all the way to the did we just hit a million orders stage, Shopify is there to help you grow. Whether you're selling scented soap or offering outdoor outfits, Shopify helps you sell. Wherever and whatever you're selling, Shopify's got you covered. Sign up for a $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash try. Go to shopify.com slash try now to grow your business, no matter what stage you're in. Shopify.com slash try. You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. You have my sword. And you have my bow. And, and my, my trowel. Hi, you're listening to episode 16 of And My Trowel, where we look at the fantastic side of archaeology and the archaeological side of fantasy. I'm Tilly. And I'm Ash. And this is part two of our discussion with special guest, drumroll, Dr. Amber Roy. Hi. <laughs> Who are chatting all about the mighty axe. So... To recap on our current situation, we have this beautifully designed polished stone axe that two representatives from the Buzzkardum Society of Dwarvish History need help with classifying. Now, I did realize afterwards that I'm not sure exactly what issue they're having. They both strode off so quickly after handing it over that I completely forgot to ask for further details. So I've now just sent a message by Carrier Pigeon to ask for more information on that. While we wait for their answer, perhaps we could already talk a bit about the kind of general archaeology and history of axes. Yeah, for like example, when did humans start using axes? You said Neolithic, but Amber, do you think it is it the very beginnings of time? Tell us. <laughs> axes have been used in various different forms for I mean for thousands of years. For instance, we can look at Paleolithic axes, so from the beginnings of Homo sapiens and even Neanderthal species and other hominins have created large hand axes. And um, they have various different forms and sizes, which is it's amazing. This is thousands of years of people coming up with ideas that we can have an axe in, in a certain form. But it's when we get to the late Mesolithic and the Neolithic that we get the idea of an, a, like a polished stone axe mm-hmm. and that is hafted in the way that we often think about. That's when that really starts to appear. And then we also start getting developments in axes and they change and they get perforations, their blades and their butts expand, they get decorations. They're, yeah, lots of different things start happening as we end up traveling through prehistory. And so they sort of, you say that they change and they always wear stone tools, but this one they specifically mentioned is a polished stone axe. So what does that mean? Does that mean there's different kinds of stone axes? Yeah, well, all axes made of a ground stone are likely to be polished. If the axe is made of a material that can be napped, uh, such as flint or shirt or quartz, um, then they sometimes are polished, but often they are left in their more angular, napped shape. But when it comes to more granular stones, such as like igneous rocks, then the process of making these axes is irrelevant whether it's going to turn it into a um, beautifully curved battle axe or a very straight stone axe. They would grind these axes against stone, possibly with another mater- like a granular sand like material and water. And that if you keep doing that, that will polish an axe. But also if you rub an axe with a softer material such as leather, then that creates a really beautifully polished surface. Mm-hmm. And this I mean most most axes made of a coarse stone will have been polished to some degree. And some are so unbelievably shiny. They're so beautiful. And people Even must now. have spent hours and hours oh. uh, polishing these. Okay. Which, is that related to kind of what they, like, well, I guess we'll get into this in a, in a bit, but like in terms of use, is that related to how polished they are? I mean, if certain things, do you need polished axes for certain things where a more jagged um, traditionally, one would work? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Um, well, yes, in terms of use wear, for instance, if you're using an axe and it, uh, there's a fracture and a flake of stone re- is removed, then the angular topography of that damage means that it's more likely to break again. So if you then grind it and polish it and make it smoother, it's less likely likely to fracture again. Mm. So that's like a functional aspect oh, okay. of it. But traditionally, if an axe is really highly polished, it's seen as, as non-functional because people think, well, of course, someone spent such a long time making that look, look <laughs> beautiful, they'll never use it. Right. And that's actually really not the case at all. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, interesting. Yeah, no, very cool, very cool. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. And are axes universal? Are they found in different or specific cultures, in especially like in prehistory and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's amazing that you can find axes across. I think across the world in prehistoric societies, where people who haven't been in contact with each other start producing these forms on their own. But there are also some ethnographic examples of people in the last 100 to 200 years and various places in in the world have made polished stone axes which look very, very similar to Neolithic polished stone axes. And, and, you know, there are some museum collections that have both and they've got a bit confused in in some places. So So it's it's, it's like a development of thought, I think, that naturally Mm -hmm. comes when people think about what they might need to use a certain material for. Yeah, and so they're very similar. The typologies are almost the same, but they're thousands of years apart. Yeah, I mean, for, for Neolithic polished stone axes, which, is, which are very flat, mm-hmm. then they are very similar. When you get to axes like basil axes, then because these are, have very distinctive forms that are spe- quite regionally specific, then it's more difficult to find, say, something made in the last 200 years look the same as a Middle Neolithic B battle axe. Yeah, but then again, within prehistory, you do find similar things with perforated stone axes. So a simple shaft hole axe, uh, they are found in context dating from the Middle to Late Mesolithic up until the Late Bronze Age, all across Europe. And... That's probably because it's quite a simple and obvious and very functional tool that Mm -hmm. most people will go, yeah, all right. I mean, that's quite easy to use and make and we'll just do that. And then you also get things like the Middle Neolithic B battle axes in in Scandinavia and then battle axes, which are a little bit similar in early Bronze Age Britain. And that's a good thousand years later. Yeah. And so you just sort of mentioned that like it's it's kind of it's sort of yeah there's only so many ways to make an axe <laughs> like it's kind of one of those yeah. universal tools but do you think that everyone would have been able to make a stone axe i mean you've said that like all the polishing and everything would have taken lots of time now i know that this is a word that a lot of materials that people hate hearing but do you think there were specialists in, in the axe making or was it kind of something that everyone could have done yes it would take a lot of time but i think it's quite an easy skill you don't need access to specific resources but that would change depending on if they're making axes from a stone source that can be controlled then that would change the access to resources but in the scenario where there isn't access the there's there's no restrictions on that then it's easy to get the the things you need to to make these and then Mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where you don't need to learn say how to smelt something you don't need to learn kind of chemistry and things like that, you can watch somebody huh. and then give it a go. Which I guess changes probably when metal axes start to come into play, because I guess with stone, everyone's doing kind of stone working or flint napping and all that kind of stuff. But then once metal happens, then it might become a little more specialized. Yeah. And there are many different elements that can contribute to things like this that you you have to think about who has access to what resources and who's going to be controlling knowledge and all of these different things and whether they're making whether there's for whatever reason there's a set group of people making these items even if it's easy to access resources and knowledge or or not or whether it's the kind of thing where anybody could make something then you know that that really really changes it but you can look at the stone to really work that out you know, Neolithic polished stone axes in Britain are made from very distinctive 
stone types from specific, very specific sources. Whereas early Bronze Age stone battleaxes in Britain are made from any kind of stone. They're going off to scree slopes and rivers and they're getting a bit of rock and they're going, oh, that looks about right. That's <laughs> like the matrix is nice. Oh, That'll do. That's about <laughs> the rock nice shape. I'm going to make something. And that's a completely different avenue of getting stone mm-hmm. and can mean something completely different. Yeah. And so do you, do you find that there's, there's trade going on in these areas? Do you find that, that people are using stones from different areas that they do not live in and they're making these axes? Or is it only the resources that are in their environment and their landscape? For Neolithic stone axes, we find those from specific sources. For instance, there's a source in the Lake District. It's a peak pipe of stickle that's a very... A stone quarry, essentially, at a very high point, and that's called Group Six. And axes made of Group Six are found all across the UK. They're the most most prolific axe group, traded all over the place. From just and, one place. Yeah. Wow. And there, I mean, other rocks as well. You see Group Seven axes. They're made from a source in North Wales, and you see their distribution mostly kind of slightly more locally within the North Welsh community. But then there are further, some that go further afield. Mm-hmm. There's there's a, a lot of work on the distribution of, of these, but they are definitely, there's no way that they that could have happened accidentally mm-hmm. and that there, there was a lot of movement of these objects. But even British early Bronze Age stone battle axes, some of those have clearly moved some way. So there's evidence of moving from like south to west in, in, in Scotland and from well, north of England until to, to South Scotland. So not across the entire country, but they are moving some distance, some of them. Wow, very cool. Yeah, that's super cool. So Telly talked a bit about metal there and coming into kind of, you know, the Bronze Age from, from the Neolithic and even into the Iron Age and when you start to get different types of axes. What's the functional difference between stone and metal axes? So... Both stone and metal axes can be used in many of the same ways. So chopping and splitting wood, both will be able to be used very easily in the same way. But they are both very different materials. And that actually means that the form they take and also the way that they are made really influences it influences their form and it influences their use. So axes made of stone often their blades are much wider than metal axes. Mm. And that means that metal axes can be used for much finer finer work, like chopping and shaping. Whereas a stone axe, you could do this for the same thing, but the traces you leave behind are going to be much wider and maybe not so accurate Mm. or fine. So that that may really influence the decision if you have a stone axe and a flint and a a metal axe, which one you would use. Mm. But also... Because stone axes tend to have slightly wider blades, and some of them also have quite nice wide butts, then they are much better than battle axes at being used as hammers. Right. Yeah, I was going to say that you could like use it in different ways, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which, and some have, and even some metal axes later on have that kind of thing, right? Where there's an axe on one side and a hammer on the other side, which I guess is then trying to copy almost the earlier stone axes, you could say? Or is that completely wrong? <laughs> Yeah, possibly. Or they've just identified that it would be useful to have a hammer in. I mean, I mean it's always useful to have a hammer around. Right, there. you have those nails. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh, where's yeah. my axe? <laughs> like, yeah, I like a, like a soft palleted hammer. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. Especially if you're building things or you're doing just general life, I think it's probably a good thing to incorporate a hammer somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Tilly, I think the pigeon has come back. Oh, excellent. Okay, well, uh, let's just take a very quick break while I read the reply and we'll be right back. Okay, I'm back and I have a little bit more information from the Buzz Kardum Society of Dwarvish History. Oh, great. Yeah. So basically, they don't know whether to classify this object as a weapon 
people as a tool. So they have two exhibitions currently planned in their community center. They have a display for those objects associated with like battles, fighting, you know, big power and ceremony, and another display for those objects associated with like mining tools, more functional sort of everyday objects. And apparently deciding which one to put this historic stone axe in has caused quite the debate within the society. So, Amber, how can we actually tell what this axe was used for? What method do you use? Microware analysis is a really brilliant method to work this out. What is? What is microware analysis? <laughs> so, microware analysis is the use of a microscope or different types of microscope to look at the traces left behind from a, an object's life, which could be from manufacture, its use, its treatment, its storage. And then we can think of many examples in our, like in our kitchen, for instance, where we could look at what, the, you know, the lives of objects. If we think about our cutlery drawer, take out a knife and imagine when that knife was new, it was nice and shiny and brand new. And then now it's probably covered in loads of scratches. <laughs> and that's from like cutting things up and movement in the cutlery drawer, banging against other pieces of cutlery. And, you know, that's useful. That's microware. And we can look at th these traces we can see microscopically we don't need a microscope but if we did look at a knife under a microscope we see even more traces and so that, that's what i do and many other archaeologists do to zoom into these micro scales on objects and see what has been left behind from all the different interactions that objects have with people and other objects and you can still see those traces even after like thousands of years yeah yeah it's quite amazing I mean, sometimes things like stone, sometimes they're very weathered and that it removes traces. But often if it's not, if they're not too weathered, then there are amazing traces left behind that can tell you so much information. And when we don't have any other information about these objects, then we can, we can work out, you know, what, what actually happened. And we can then use that to learn about the people who interacted with those objects. Very cool. Hmm. That's very cool. Very cool. But like, what equipment do you need to look at useware? Like, how do you do it? <laughs> <laughs> so it's it's really essential to have a microscope. Okay. A good method to use is to try and use both low and high power microscopes. So a low power microscope would be a stereo microscope. And then additionally, using a high power microscope, such as something like a metallographic microscope, something that can go up to, say, times 200, times 300, then you can zoom in really far and see things like the polish left on objects. And if you, if you try and look at polish, then you can identify things like contact material, which is a little bit harder to identify at lower magnifications. But it's, it's essential to go between like low scales and, and high scales in, in magnification because you get to see different, different types of use wear. And you said contact material so what do you mean by co literally what it has come in contact with yeah yes yeah. exactly so what kind of stuff would you would you see there so if a stone has been in contact with wood then it would leave a specific type of polish I and mean, of course if it had been in contact with wood for like one second and like nothing more then it probably wouldn't leave very many traces but you know if you'd use <laughs> say if you use an axe to chop wood for half an hour you're definitely going to find a nice bit of polish and wood polish on stone tends to create a domed appearance on the top of stone grains and when this is quite developed it forms like a sort of domed plateau that's very smooth and has a directionality so it, it's it follows a certain direction and has parallel striations through it that follows this direction and that's quite indicative of contact with wood that's really really cool isn't it that you can you can glean that piece of information from that and what can you do with that information well i mean really that's essential to work out if something was used and how it was used mm -hmm. and being able to identify the contact material can for instance if if we are, don't do high power analysis and we're looking at something at lower magnifications we can say oh this has parallel striations on both blade edges it was probably used with a chopping motion and the high topography of the stone grains is slightly rounded maybe it's a medium hardness contact material 
and that could be wood, but there are other other examples that are of a medium hardness. And then if you look at polish under higher magnifications, that can give you give you more information for what kind of medium hardness contact material. And then we've got two things. Oh, that was in contact with wood and it was used in a chopping motion. I wonder great. what they were doing. <laughs> what were they doing? I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> chopping wood. <laughs> and how do you know? what material it was used on like i assume you can't just look at a piece of stone and be like aha this was clearly you know sherlock style this was clearly used on a piece of wood like what <laughs> how do you know what those His traces are his name was dorothy yeah, and exactly. therefore <laughs> <laughs> robin was singing on a nearby branch <laughs> yeah <laughs> well i mean it takes a lot of time to look at objects that have been used in experiments so uh, experimental reference collections and then you have something and you know exactly how long it's been used for and how it's been used and what contact material and it's developing this knowledge of, of, of i mean i have this this image reference collection in my brain now from just looking at so many different things <laughs> that when you look at something under a microscope it's so much easier to then go ah yeah i think it might be that but then i also come across stuff that i haven't seen before Ooh. And then, then that's exciting, and I have to think about different possibilities and try and find other places where I'm, people might have found that also, or 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 think about an experiment that needs to happen. Ooh. And cool. but so because of that, like because you need to have that little reference collection in your head, does that mind mean that you have to be specialised in like a particular material? So, for example, could you also look at metal axes and be like, aha, yes, I also know what these were used on, or is it? very material specific uh, to some extent it's material specific but it depends i mean I, i've in my training for use for uh, as a use for analyst i trained in lots of different materials and then i focused on stone mm. so uh, if, if you are a use for analyst it wouldn't be that hard to then say oh i actually want to start looking at bone and mm. the background knowledge and the skills are there to then look at a reference collection and pick things up quite easily. Mm. So it's you just a have to make sure. You have skill to a, hey. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure you could go to like a job interview about like marketing and say, hey, I have these transferable skills. I, I can know. look, <laughs> I can look at your stone <laughs> and your bone. <laughs> It depends on what you're marketing. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and I mean, you mentioned that, you know, sometimes you come across things that you, you haven't seen before. How do you know what experiments to do? Like, do you just sort of pick randomly like, right, axes were, were probably used on these materials. So we do it. Do you have like, I don't know, archaeological, some kind of archaeological evidence that you can use it on? Or, or I mean, Neolithic is prehistory, so I guess you wouldn't have written records. So how do you plan the experiments for the reference collection? It's a bit of everything. It's useful to do some useful analysis to see, oh, I think this, you know, it, it was in contact with wood or it was used in similar motions. And then you can design experiments around those uh, those hypotheses that you create from the traces. Mm. That's a useful scenario. But also I mean, it's quite useful to think about how people lived in the past and what kind of things that we have evidence for them making mm. and using that as a way to think, oh, OK, could you use an axe in this way and could you use an axe in that way? And there are, I mean, there are many different ways you could create an experiment. The, I mean, the possibilities are endless. I would love to just spend days and days and days and days and days using axes in so many different ways. I mean, that sounds so much fun. <laughs> it, does, it does. Can we come? Yeah, yeah we'll come. I want to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so what's been your best experience with microware analysis, like within your own research? I think this, this definitely goes back to fighting against these traditional interpretations that axes yes. are purely ceremonial. And I've shown from doing work on Neolithic polished stone axes from Britain, early Bronze Age stone battle axes and axe hammers from Northern Britain, and then now my current project looking at Middle Neolithic B Scandinavian battle axes. In all these cases, I've been able to use microanalysis analysis to say these were utilitarian functional tools, and the idea that they are non-functional and purely ceremonial is incorrect. And actually, there's probably many more complex reasons why these objects might end up in contexts either ceremonial, such as burials. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is the most exciting thing. 
for me. <laughs> That, that is very exciting. I mean, we, me and Tilly, we always talk about how, well, I think every archaeologist talks about how burials are <laughs> <Or> not <should. laughs> for the dead, they're for the living. Uh-huh. And yeah, that what's in there represents something else. But yes, it doesn't mean that it wasn't used. And it's really, really important to break down these older stereotypes that we have around different archaeological material. Otherwise, we just don't learn we don't do archaeology do we it's all about collecting information so yeah that that's really yeah exactly (laughs) it's also i think it just shows how much we as archaeologists can very easily jump to assumptions and we can use our modern lived experiences to interpret the past and actually people in the past they probably thought about things very differently to us they interpreted things differently they also had their own lived experiences and they lived in a world very different to ours so we have mm-hmm. to really think outside the box and try and use different methods to be like, well, what actually was happening? Because it's probably not what we automatically think of. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, and especially in this case, because we're in a fantasy universe. So there's even another step like of, <laughs> of removal that we have to, you know, take in terms of our interpretation. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, fantasy is a wonderful way of actually opening up our eyes to other possibilities. Mm-hmm. There are so many fantasy worlds that have been created and are being created. And these, these think outside the box oh, and yeah. being able to, to look at fantasy and then go, oh, maybe I can apply this to archaeological thought. Mm-hmm. It's actually very useful. Tilly, we're useful. <laughs> I'm, <there, right? laughs> I'm blushing. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> well, so I, I agree indeed. I think that microware or, or useware analysis and experiment archaeology, I think that sounds like the absolute best method that we can apply to this uh, thing. And I'm not at all biased in this decision either, uh, in that respect. <laughs> but so Amber, seeing as you're here, and yes, I, I do do microware analysis as well, but not on axes and haven't done it on ground stone for a while. So uh, I think, Amber, it might be the best thing as you're here and you're an expert in this particular object and material and kind of time period-ish, uh, I guess, in question. Would you be able to have a quick look at the stone axe and just, you know, let us know what you think? We have a microscope over there for you. Of course, I'd be very happy to do this. <laughs> mm, great. Okay. But before you do that, do you have anything that you'd like to share with our listeners? Perhaps you've got some exciting projects on, uh, are coming up or in the future for you? I will be finishing my current project in September. So watch this space for some publications, oh, oh. possibly some articles, maybe a book. I've not quite decided yet. So that, that that's coming up. That's very exciting. And I also organize an experimental archaeology research group here at Stockholm University. And we have an exciting workshop in April where we're going to design various different experiments from different points of view. So that's something exciting that we're going to be doing. And because my current project ends in September, I've been planning and submitting grant applications for a new project. So funding permitting, hopefully, at the end of the year, I'll be starting a new project, exploring zoomorphic stone and slate axes and daggers. And these are so exciting. Oh my God, you can get them. these stone axes that have bear heads engraved what? Yes. and slate daggers with elk heads on the ends of their handles. They're amazing. <gasps> so hopefully I'll be able to do a project on those. Okay. From where? From where? Hang on. <laughs> this That's is all cool. new to me. Where? Where? What time period? Or like? Uh, so these are... These are near, possibly late Mesolithic and Neolithic. Oh, God. <laughs> and they span mostly across northern Fennoscandia, so Norway, Sweden, and Finland. Ah. But you find a few of them going slightly further south. And then you find some other kind of zoomorphic stone objects around the Baltic country, in the countries around the Baltic Sea and the Neolithic. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's very so cool. cool. That's cool. so cool. <laughs> that's just nerd out for a second. Like, that's right? so cool. So you're going to come back and tell us all about that? Yeah, we'll have to do another episode. Yeah, Yeah, definitely. (laughs) Sounds good. Well, well, I think that that's about it for this episode of And My Trowel. We hope you enjoyed this quest-ish scenario problem. Thank you so, so much to Amber for helping us out with this particular problem. It was really great to have you join us and we've definitely learned a lot. So thank you. Oh, it's been so great. I've really enjoyed this. and Hopefully I can come back and talk about some elkheads and yes. other axes with interesting ends you've said it live now like on <laughs> it's recorded yeah. we have your promise it's in blood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i better get the funding for the project now. exactly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well good luck with that wishing you all the best 
And uh, yes, thank you to everyone here for listening. In the meantime, until our next episode, we are always looking for new episode ideas. So please, if you have any suggestions for us, do get in contact via email or social media. All of our contact information as well as all of the information on what Amber is doing in her research and several of the studies that have been chatted about today can be found in the show notes. Hey, Tilly. Mm -hmm. I was just looking through these boxes and I found something else that's a little bit weird. Oh, are those teeth? (laughs) Yeah, they are. But they're kind of long and strangely pointed. (sighs) You know what? I think I know someone who might be able to help us with those. This episode was produced by Chris Webster from his RV traveling the United States, Tristan Boyle in Scotland, DigTech LLC, Cultural Media, and the Archaeology Podcast Network, and was edited by Rachel Roden. This has been a presentation of the Archaeology Podcast Network. Visit us on the web for show notes and other podcasts at www.archpodnet.com. Contact us at chris at archaeologypodcastnetwork.com.